folks, this is The Gifted Ones, and I'm your host, Liz Throp, and today we are talking with Steve Boucher. Now, Steve is an alien abductee, and I'm super pumped to talk to you about your experiences, which, from what I understand, it's been over seven or eight experiences where you've encountered not only the aliens, but you've actually been on their on their craft. Now... Um, In 1983, Steve picked up up a book called Missing Time by Bud Hopkins, and it literally changed your life. Now, Steve is also an artist and a musician and one of the few brave souls that I know that is willing to discuss his experience of meeting aliens and boarding their craft. So without further ado, welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I I really appreciate it because it is not an easy thing, I'm sure, for you to discuss publicly, even though I know you already have. Um, Mm -hmm. But could you share with our viewers, um, you you have two incidents that um, we sort of talked about, one in 1959 and another one in 1973 that took place. Could you share with our viewers what that's about? Sure. Uh, the first one in uh, 1959, I was about four years old back then. I'm giving away my age here. But <laughs> That's anyway, okay. Uh, you look great. <laughs> yeah. And I was uh, coming home from somewhere with my dad. And uh, I believe it was in Owen Sound. And uh, I'm not sure where we were coming back from, but it was uh, fairly late at night. And we were going down a country road. And there were trees on both sides of the road. Uh, these, I think they were evergreen trees from what I remember. And back in those days, uh, the cars had a, a shelf behind the back seat. Right. And, I remember uh, those. I was small enough that I used to climb up uh, <laughs> and lay down on that shelf. I did too. And <laughs> I, I could look something. out the back window uh, and see the stars. And so uh, that's what I was doing. And I noticed that... Uh, there was a, a bright white star that seemed to be following us. And I was kind of uh, surprised to, to see a star moving like that, you know. And it got brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger, and yeah. I realized it was getting close to us. So I got down off the shelf, and I climbed over the, uh, over the seat into the front seat, and uh, I asked my dad, I said, what's that light out there? And he said, what light? And I said, that light. And I pointed out uh, the driver's window, and he looked. And it was uh, following us, tracking our speed at at treetop level. Incredible. And matching our speed. And uh, my dad immediately got very agitated. And uh, I said, what is it? And he said, shut up, leave me alone. (laughs) You know, he doesn't usually yeah. s- didn't usually speak to me like yeah. that, so I could see he was visibly shaken. And uh, the the craft uh, shot ahead of us, and it came down in the middle of the road, and it it was so bright that it kind of lit up all the trees, and it lit up the road and everything. And uh, um, we couldn't uh, go any further; we had to stop because it was right in the middle of the road and so uh, my dad managed to regain his composure and he said to me uh, he said I want you to stay in the car and he said and stay low so they don't see you and he says I'm going to go out and see what they want but he said don't you leave the car no matter what you stay in the car and stay low (laughs) and uh, so he got out And he walked toward the ship, and I looked out, and I could see that through the front window that there were two beings standing in the road. Wow. And uh, they were what we would normally call the the gray beings with the large heads and the big black eyes. But how uh, tall were they? uh, I would say about maybe uh, four feet um, or less. Right. Three and a half to four feet. So little. And... uh, but to me, they look like adults because when you're a little child, everybody looks like an adult. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, I watched my dad go over, and he was uh, talking to the one being, um, which I assumed was the leader, 
and over the leader's left shoulder behind him, there was another being, and he was just standing there uh, watching. And I was very curious, and I wanted to get out, and I wanted to see who they were, and uh, when you're a small child like that, you can get away with a lot, you know? Yeah, you sure can. <laughs> so uh, I disobeyed him, and I got out through the driver's door, and I walked over to uh, where he was standing, and he could hear me coming, and he shielded me from the sight of the being he was talking to with his body. And he put his hand behind his back, and he was waving for me to get back in the yeah, car. Get you know? back, yeah. And uh, uh, so I came up behind him, and the being that was talking to him just suddenly looked over his shoulder and saw me, and then he said to my dad, uh, you seem to be concerned about the child. And uh, now I couldn't hear him with my ears, but I heard him in my head. Okay, so they weren't vocally speaking. No. They were speaking through your mind. It was telepathic, okay. yeah. Very cool. Okay. And um, when I looked at his eyes, I could hear him clear. But if I looked away slightly, I couldn't quite hear him at as okay, clear. okay. So you have to be looking at them to understand what they're saying. Um, so anyway, uh, my dad said, yes, that's, that's my boy. And then realizing that the being had saw me, he turned around to me and he said, I told you to stay in the car. Now go on back and get in the car and stay there until I'm done. And I said, no, but I want to see, you know. And <laughs> yeah. Every parent's so, nightmare right there, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, and so uh, the being that was talking to my dad said, would you like my crew member to take him back to the vehicle for you? And my dad uh, kind of said, no, that, that's okay. We have to get going. My wife's waiting for me at home, and we have to go. And, and so the, the being that was talking to him looked at the other being, and he immediately came over to me, took me by the hand, and he walked me back to the, to the car. And my dad was just standing there kind of dumbfounded in the road watching us. And, and uh, I could see he was worried. He wasn't comfortable with that at no all. No kidding, no <laughs> kidding. But anyway, the, I got back in the, in the vehicle, and the being that was with me got in beside me. And so he was sitting in the driver's seat. And... Uh, he started uh, talking to me, asking me questions. And uh, I looked and I noticed that my dad was no longer standing there in the road with the other beings. So I assumed that they went on board the ship. And uh, so the, uh, the being that was with me, he was asking me questions. Like he had his hands on the steering wheel and he said, what does this do? And I said, well, that makes the car go this way or that way, whichever way you, you want to go. And then he looked down at the pedals on the floor, and he said, what do these do? And I said, well, that, make, that one makes the car go, and that one makes it stop. And uh, So then he asked me about the radio. He pointed to the radio, and he said, what does this do? And I said, well, that's the radio. And uh, I said, you can hear people talking on it, and you can hear music. And he said, oh, I see. And he said, can you talk back to them on it? And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. It only, only works. You can only hear on it. And he said, okay. And then he asked me what I did uh, if I went to school. And I said, no, that, uh, that's next year. So that's how I know I was four. Right, okay. Time. Okay, makes and, sense. And uh, so basically he babysat me and kept me busy while my dad was being abducted. You know? yeah. And um, so, how much time had passed before you were re like reunited with your father? Well, I think uh, it's it's hard to say because uh, you know I was only four at the time, but I I would say probably maybe around twenty minutes or half an hour, right? You know, and so then I saw my dad come out with the other being, and. Uh, uh, the being that was with me said, uh, I have to go now. And I said, can't you stay a little bit longer? Because uh, 
you know, he was taking an interest in me, of and uh, I enjoyed his company. And and he he said, well, maybe for a minute. And then I looked out the front window, and I saw the the being talking with my dad nodded to him. And he said, now I do have to go. And so he got out, and he passed my dad in the road as he was going back to the ship. My dad was coming back to the to the car. And... Um, so we, uh, my dad got in, and we sat there, and we watched them go on the ship, and, and we saw the, the ship lift up and take off. And uh, it didn't take off really fast. It just kind of went slow and coasted over the trees. And then my dad started the car, and he was kind of quiet. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, <laughs> so we, wow. we drove a little ways, and then I noticed... Uh, that they were coming back again. They came back a second time, and they did exactly the same thing. They went down in the road in front of us, and uh, I remember my dad muttering something like, oh, what the hell do they want now? And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the one being got out of the craft, and he walked over to the car, and he motioned for my dad to lower the window, and Back in those days, you had to crank them down. They weren't electronic. And yeah. So he rolled the window down, and uh, he said, what is it? And the being said, you forgot these. And he handed him his glasses. And uh, so after that, uh, he walked back to the ship, and they took off, and we went home. And that was basically where that in- incident ended. And your, and your father and you, from what I understand, didn't really talk about it. It was just, uh, that just happened, and as a child, you probably didn't see that it was a strange, or you didn't have the fear, because did your father explain what happened? Like, did you ask him what was that? No, uh, basically, we both kind of forgot about it. Okay. And uh, uh, and I think that's interesting that you say that, because you in your... Your second um, one that we're going to be discussing, yeah. um, I, if I recall, recall correctly, um, did the aliens not say that they were you wouldn't remember the incident? Yes, okay. they uh, they wipe your memory after. Okay, after so that every explains incident. why you didn't have the conversation with your father. So let's yeah. fast forward now to um, 1973. Okay, and. Explain to the the folks watching what that take us to that scene. Okay, well, we had played a, a gig at Niagara on the Lake at a place called the American Hotel, and after the gig, uh, our drummer said uh, we've been invited to a party, and he said, uh, you know, I know it's late, but are, would you guys be up for it to uh, maybe go and play a set there and just one set and then we'll go and we said sure you know so we drove to uh, Vineland and uh, we went to this party and we uh, we set up our instruments and uh, played a set and there was a, a a guy that came up to us after we finished and we were leaving and uh, he just looked like a regular teenager with long hair and blue jeans and a uh, winter coat. It was uh, it was winter at the time. There was a Christmas tree in the room that we played in. Mm-hmm. So it must have been around December of, or somewhere around there. Yeah. And uh, he asked us if we were going to St. Catharines, and we said, yeah. And he said, do you mind if I hitch a ride with you? So uh, the guitarist agreed to let him come with us. And uh, we all piled in the back of the van. There was only two seats in it. Uh, The guitarist and the drummer were sitting in the passenger seat. And we were all sitting in the back. Uh, Myself, the drummer's girlfriend, uh, and the uh, bass player, and this hitchhiker. So six people all together. Yeah, and we had all the uh, equipment, the drums and the... um, amps and stuff like that in the back there and so we were all kind of sitting on the floor uh, and we were talking uh, as we were driving and then at one point uh, the uh, guitarist stopped 
And we said, why are you stopping? And he said, well, you better take a look at this because you're not going to believe me. <laughs> and so we looked over the seat and in the middle of the, um, of the service road, there was a, a large saucer-shaped craft sitting there. It had red lights all around the perimeter, and it had uh, what looked like recessed portholes. Okay. And was it and, like silver in color, or was it like a color? Uh, no, it was uh, basically silver, like a metallic. metallic uh, okay. And uh, it was on tripod legs. And would well, you be able to describe for all of us the size, scale to size? Was it the size of a car, the size of a bus? Well, uh, I would say it was probably about uh, 50 or 60 feet in diameter. What, so big? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, it had uh, these lights underneath it, like little searchlights that were sort of in different colors, and they were moving back and forth over the road. Okay. I think the, the driver asked me, he said, what do you think it is? And I said, well... I don't know, maybe it's a, a movie prop. Maybe they're doing a movie. And he said, well, why would they be doing a movie at uh, <laughs> 3 in the morning? <laughs> Good question, you know? right. And uh, yeah. so uh, he said, I don't really want to go near that thing. So I think maybe we should turn around and take a different way home, maybe go the back way. Right. So we said, okay. And uh, that's what we agreed to do. So when we started moving... Again, I noticed that uh, we weren't turning. We were heading toward it. And I, I said, why aren't we turning? And he said, well, it, the steering wheel doesn't seem to be working. He said, look. And he had it cranked over as far as it would go. And we were still traveling in a straight line. And at that point, um, I asked him, well, put on the brake. And he said, I'm trying to. And he's pumping the brake and nothing's wow, happening. that's scary. And then I realized that uh, I wasn't feeling any of the bumps that you normally so feel you when you're driving. hovering. Yeah. That's so uh, cool. okay. I feel that they must have levitated us up, uh, you know, a few inches above the road. And we were heading toward this thing so fast that I was actually breaking, bracing for impact because I thought we were going to hit it. No kidding. And uh, wow. Uh, when we got up close to it, uh, we slowed down and came back to rest on the road again, but uh, the van wouldn't start, and we were about maybe uh, maybe 30 feet away from it at that point. And everybody in, in the van was panicking. We were all talking at once and, and yelling, and, and the drummer, he turned out to be the voice of reason, and he turned around and he said, everybody just shut up. <laughs> so we all went quiet, and he said, now, what we should do is stay very quiet, don't make any sound, stay low, and uh, if we don't move, we don't make any sound, then maybe they'll leave us alone. And... Um, Good plan. Yeah, so that's what we had planned to do. And uh, then uh, the drummer said, uh, oh, no. And I said, what is, it? what is it? And he said, they're they're getting out. And I said, well, what do they look like? And he said, they're just little guys. And I said, I want to see. And he said, no, stay down, stay down. <laughs> and uh, so we were, like, I could feel this fear of everybody in the van. We were all terrified. Of course. Yeah. And I was wondering if, you know, if we get into, uh, if we get attacked by these beings, we might have to defend ourselves. So I was looking around and I grabbed a hold of the mic stand and I thought, if they get in here, I'm going to start hitting them with the yeah. mic stand. And uh, so uh, at one point, we could hear them trying the doors. You know, they were moving around the van. And there was one side window in the van that uh, you could see out of. And I saw this head go by the window. It just kind of floated by. And uh, it was, uh, it, I saw these black eyes that curved up around the, the side of the head. Right. And uh, Like the typical picture that we could all 
image, right? Yeah. With what? So it was very common for you to see. So if you see those pictures, that's how you saw them physically. Right. Okay. Interesting. And uh, so I, uh, when I saw this head, I said, did you see that? Everybody said, shh, you know. And uh, so then the guy that, the hitchhiker that we picked up was sitting in the back corner of the van next to the back doors. And for some reason, he started looking around at us. And then he just, out of the blue, he reached over and he grabbed the handle on the back door and opened it and pushed the door open. Oh my and uh, I couldn't believe he'd done that. Like We were just shocked that he did this. Yeah. And, and uh, there were three beings standing there. And uh, they were in a line. And uh, the being in the front immediately got up into the van. And he came in. And uh, we couldn't move. I was, I was trying to move, and I couldn't move. And uh, he looked around, and, and I looked at his eyes, and I could hear him in my head. And he said, I'm sorry, but we had to paralyze you temporarily because you were thinking thoughts of violence and I was concerned for my safety and the safety of my crew and he said we don't mean you any harm he said uh, we're not violent we just want to run some tests on uh, some of you and then you can be on your way and uh, so he he looked around and he looked at the hitchhiker and he said uh, I'd like you and then he looked at the bass player and he said, and you, and then he turned to look at me. And when he turned to look at me, I looked at the floor. I didn't want to look at his eyes. Yeah. And uh, it was just this dead silence. And finally I couldn't resist it. And I looked up at his eyes and he said, and you. And so he said, would you follow me please? Wow. And he turned around and he, uh, he was standing up fully, and he was clearing the top of the van by about maybe uh, six inches. So, so he, he was have, pretty uh, small. Yeah, he'd be very small. Because we couldn't stand up in the van. But So he started moving toward the uh, back of the van, and his foot got caught in the snare drum stand, and it fell over, and the snare drum rolled out and landed on the pavement. And immediately one of the other beings picked it up, and looked at it and uh, so when I got out um, I was looking directly into the face of this uh, being and uh, this thought came into my head like oh my god are you ever ugly <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I started like as soon as I thought that thought the being turned his head away from me like he looked embarrassed oh. and then I realized that he could hear me and then I started thinking well maybe I can hear him so was that him thinking that thought about me or me thinking that about right, him you right. know and oh my uh, gosh so anyway uh, when I got out uh, he handed the drum to the leader and uh, he looked at me and he said is this yours and I said no and he said, who does it belong to? And I pointed to the drummer. And the drummer gave me this dirty look. Like, you like know. thanks, pointing yeah. out, yeah. And so the being, uh, the leader said to the other being, go and get him. And so he went around to the driver's side. And he came back with, uh, with the drummer. And uh, so the leader handed him the drum. And he said, is this yours? And he said, yeah, it's mine. And he said, uh, is it damaged? And he said, no, it looks okay. And he just put it on the floor of the van. <clears throat> so at that point, the drummer became one of us too that was picked. So now there were uh, four of us going on board. Wow, okay. And the guitarist and uh, the drummer's girlfriend remained in the, in the van. So... Uh, the they drummer brought us must have just loved you for that. <laughs> he must have been like, thanks. Well, he was some friend you are. <laughs> he was uh, very uncooperative with them. He didn't want to go along with. Uh, yeah, yeah, what they no kidding. At all. Yeah. 
But uh, they lined us all up along the side of the van. And the leader said, we're all going on the ship together as one unit. And he said, so I want you to turn to your left and look at the back of the person in front of you. And we're all going to move in a straight line. And he said, uh, when we start to move, he said, um, don't look to the left or the right. Just keep looking at the back of the person in front of you. And uh, he said, and when we go on the ship, don't touch the hull. So uh, we started moving as one unit. And it was really strange because we were levitated above the ground. Okay. And uh, sort of how they were walking. Like yeah. they weren't typically one foot in front of the other. They were just right. kind of, okay. And the leader was in the front. And there was another being in the back. And uh, so we all moved as one unit. And then when we came toward the entrance of the ship, we turned toward the entrance and we sort of angled upward so that uh, uh, we were moving up into the, uh, the entrance. And there were steps there, but uh, we were kind of, hovering above the steps, I guess. And um, uh, I'm missing a part there where uh, I looked to the left and we stopped. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme with you, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> You seem to do this a lot. <laughs> yeah. And Don't so, do it. Okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. So when I looked straight again, we kept moving. And then I looked to the right. I figured, oh, that's how it works. And we stopped again. And went, as soon as I looked to the ahead we started moving again yeah and uh, I uh, as we were going up into the ship I reached down to touch the hull <laughs> <laughs> and I just very lightly grazed my finger my ring finger over the surface of the hull and it felt hot and it felt like kind of like aluminum right and uh How'd that work out for you? Well, about uh, two weeks later, I ended up with an extremely big planter's wart on that finger. And it took So did me... you learn your lesson? Yes. To, to this day, do you still not listen? <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Yeah. Well, that's, incre that's incredible. So now you're, uh, you're in the ship. So take us from yeah. there. Well, as we were going in, the drummer was a pretty tall guy, and he banged his head on the top of the oh, geez. Uh, okay. archway where we went in and I could see there were lights inside and uh, the being in front immediately asked him if he was okay and was concerned about him and so he said yeah I'm fine and once we got inside uh, they separated us from each other so was and, it like separate rooms well, or was it all open concept inside? it was all it was kind of open where we were, but the room sort of followed the contour of the ship. It kind of curved to the okay. to the right when we came in. And um, there was another room uh, in there, but we didn't get to see inside that. So uh, uh, they brought us over to these benches, and uh, the leader was with me, and he said, uh, we'd like you to remove your garments remove your clothing and, and put it in a, a pile on the floor. And he said, uh, nobody's going to take them or anything. You'll be able to see them from where you are. And I had brought my bag of flutes with me, the wooden recorders that right. I played. And uh, uh, so he said, you can put that on top of your clothes. And so I put the bag of recorders on top of my clothes and and I noticed that the hitchhiker was uh, wearing long underwear. And that kind of, uh, I found that kind of amusing because I didn't think anybody wore long underwear anymore, you know. <laughs> but uh, so uh, after I, I took my clothes off, I had my underwear on and I said, can I keep my underwear? And he said, what is underwear? So I pulled on the strap and showed him, and he said, yes, you can keep that. And then he brought me over to this uh, other area of the ship where there was like a countertop. And he had me get up on that countertop and sit there. And 
he said, uh, I'll be back in a, in a minute. And he went over to talk to the other being. And there was another being there that had kind of a, a metallic table. And he had a, a towel on it that was holding something. And he unraveled this towel. And inside there were these instruments that looked like surgical instruments or dental instruments. Oy, oy. Something like that. Yeah. So uh, he was talking to this being, and I was thinking to myself, I've got to get something to uh, to keep because <laughs> nobody's going to believe me when I tell them this story. Yeah. But, and uh, so I was looking around for something I could take, and uh, the only thing I could see were there were metal knobs on the on these cupboards that were under the countertop I was sitting on. So I reached down and I grabbed one of them. And I thought, I wonder if I can unscrew it, if it unscrews. And so I started turning it. And sure enough, it was getting loose. So I, I turned it and turned it. And I, eventually I got it off. And I had it in my hand. And I was wondering what I was going to do with it because I didn't have any pockets to put it in or anything. You're right, and, yeah. You just know, your underwear. <laughs> and Yeah, so I was just holding it in my hand. And um, the being came back over to me and he said, we're ready to do the test now. And then he kind of looked at me funny and he said, what have you got? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you took something. And then I realized you can't hide anything from these guys. And so I opened my hand and I showed him and he took the knob out, out of my hand and he, he looked at me and he said, you can't keep this. <laughs> and... One of the other beings that the being that had the towel with the instruments said, Why not let him keep it? What harm can it do? And he said, We're not allowed to let them keep anything. And uh, he took it and he put it out of my reach. And, and then he had me get on this thing that was like a, a metallic gurney. It looked like a gurney. Right. And so I got on this thing and uh, he wheeled me over. To to this machine. There was a machine there that had this big um, circular disc-shaped uh, light thing on it. And it, it was over my head and, and uh, he had me lay back. And uh, he came over with, uh, with this instrument that looked like a, what I could only describe as the handheld unit of a contemporary phone. It was kind okay. of... Uh, rectangular shaped and um, he took this thing and it had a switch on it and he switched it on and he held his arm out and he shone this light on his arm uh, it had like a green light that and wherever the light hit his arm it was like a beam and I could <laughs> see the skeleton under his skin so th what's really interesting about that Steve mm -hmm. is like Less than a year ago, I saw through social media a device that was just invented. Yeah. That is similar to that for nurses yeah. in it. And they put it on the skin and it shows up the veins in the skin. Right. So I'm sure a majority of our viewers who are online are, have already seen that. So this was in 79? This was in 73. 73. So you yeah. you actually saw a device like that mm -hmm. taking place. And you, the first time you, so just so our viewers know, the first time you came out with this um, situation that happened to you, you, you exposed it, what year was it? It was 1973 that I saw this thing. But when did you it. first come to tell your story publicly? Uh, well... I told it uh, to Bud Hopkins in 1983. So that that's very compelling to me because yeah. you discussed this thing that wasn't yeah. even invented until like last year. So I'll carry on with that from there. Sorry, I had to bring that up because that's very compelling. Well, I have a video about that too, actually. But anyway, uh, uh, he said, now I'd like to try it on you. And I said, is it going to hurt? And he said, no, but you might feel a little bit of a tingling sensation. And he said, would you stretch your arm out? So I stretched my arm out, and he took the device, and he shone it on my arm. And where the green light hit my skin, 
I could not only see the bones underneath, I could see the the veins and the muscles and the arteries, and I could wow. see my heartbeat pumping in, in the veins. And, wow. And uh, he said, now I, I'd like to look at, at your stomach. And so he had me lay back on this uh, gurney kind of thing. And um, him and the other being, and there may have been a third one, I'm not sure, they uh, were using this device to look in my stomach. And I don't know what they were looking for or what they found, but uh, he came back to me and he said, uh, I need you to look at this light up above my head, this circular light thing. And Mm -hmm. uh, it was like... um, uh, kind of like uh, ribbon LEDs, you know, and they were in shape like in concentric circles, and they'd come on and they'd strobe toward the center. And when I was looking at this thing, it was making me dizzy and kind of tired. And I looked away and I said, "I, I don't want to look at that thing anymore." And he said, "No, look at it. It's very important." look right into the center of it. So I'm looking into the center of this thing, and the lights are moving into the center, and it was kind of drawing me in, and the next thing I knew, I was unconscious. Right, so hypnotized, yeah. uh, so to speak. Yeah, I called it a hypnodisc. Yeah, hypnodisc, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, the next thing I remember when I came to, um, I felt kind of groggy. And uh, the one being was rolling up the towel with the instruments in it. And uh, the leader said to me, I'm going to take you back to your clothes now and you can get dressed. So let me just stop you there. The instruments, were they sharp, like knife type things? Or were they just instruments that you've never seen before? Well, they were instruments that I hadn't really uh, seen anything like them, but the closest thing I could say they looked like was they looked kind of like dental instruments. Okay. You know. And did you have any scarring anywhere on your body after this event? No, I didn't have any scarring or any open wounds or anything. Uh, so I I don't know what they did. That's amazing. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. So carry on. They take you back to your clothes. Yeah. So I uh, went back to my clothes and. Uh, the other, the other guys were there getting dressed. Uh, everybody except the the drummer. The drummer was still standing in the doorway with the other being, and uh, he had been arguing with him. Uh, the being was trying to get him to remove his clothes, and he said, "No, I'm not going to do that." And he was very adamant about it. And so, uh, uh, the being did manage to convince him to stay there until we were done. I think I'd have been like the drummer. I'd have yeah. been like, no, you're not doing any yeah. experience on me. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, while we were getting dressed, uh, um, the two beings that uh, were standing there uh, said, if you want to ask us any questions, we have a little bit of time right now, so now is the time to do it. And so the one guy... Uh, asked, uh, where are you from? And they said, do you know the stars at all? And we said, well, not really. Mm -hmm. And so there was a star map on the wall, and he pointed to an area, and he said, well, probably wouldn't do me much good to tell you where we're from, but we're from this area here. And uh, in retrospect, I think that area, uh, I got the feeling that it was Orion, Okay. You know, and um, so anyway, uh, the next guy got to ask a question, and so he said, do you have any bases out here? And they said, yes, we have one out here, and they pointed toward Lake Ontario. And so then he came to me, and I'd been thinking about what I was going to ask him, and I didn't want to ask him one of the usual questions like that. I wanted to ask him something more profound. So uh, I asked him, what is the true religion on earth? Right. And uh, he seemed taken aback by that question. And uh, he looked at the other being, and then he looked at me, and he said, 
why would you ask us a question like that? Yeah. And I said, well, because you're obviously a lot more technologically advanced than we are, and you're probably more socially advanced. And so I'm guessing that you'd be more spiritually advanced as well. So if anybody would know the true religion on earth, it would be you guys. And uh, he seemed kind of satisfied with, with my answer. Yeah. And then he said to me, there is no true religion on earth. Wow. And he said, and that's, that, that's the end of the questions. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, can't you elaborate a little bit? And he said, no, I'm sorry, but we probably told you too much already. <laughs> And that was the end of the questions and answers. And so everybody started making their way out of the ship, going down the steps. And uh, I was, I deliberately waited until the others went down first, and I was the last one to go. And the being that was standing next to me put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, wait. He said, I'd like to talk to you some more. And at that point, I found myself unconscious again. I don't remember what happened after that. Okay. And the next thing I remembered, I was outside of the ship. I was standing on the pavement, looking up at the being, and he was sort of silhouetted in the doorway of the craft. And he was telling me something telepathically, but he seemed to be like talking directly to my subconscious. And uh, I was trying to focus on what he was telling me. And the last thing I remember him telling me was that uh, you're going to be a great help to your friends and family in the future. And uh, so I was trying to remember what he was telling me. And it felt like waking up from a, a dream and you're trying to remember what the dream was, and right. it's kind of drifting into your subconscious, yes. and you can't remember it. And you're trying to pull it back. And, and nothing's, it, nothing's coming to you. Right. Nothing's more frustrating than that, right? Yeah. And uh, he could see that I was doing this and that it was, uh, uh, that I was really uh, overwhelmed by it. And uh, my face started itching because it was cold. And... Uh, so I went to scratch my face, and I found that my cheeks were soaking wet. And I realized that I'd been crying. Crying, okay. And I didn't know why. And uh, so then I looked at him, and I felt this tremendous feeling of love, like a really powerful feeling of love coming from him. And I'd never felt that kind of love uh, with anybody in my life but it was like a very strong bond that I felt with him. And uh, he came down and walked over to me, and he said, wasn't there something you wanted to show me? And I said, uh, what? And he said, you wanted to show me something. And then I realized that, oh, my recorders, that's why I brought the bag with me. I was thinking if I got a chance to show them, I, you know, and uh, so I took one of them out, uh, the tenor, and I put it together. It was in three pieces. And I played a little bit, like a couple of notes on it. And then I handed it to him. And he took it, and uh, I felt him pull it out of my hand. So uh, that kind of answered a question for me as, as to whether he was like a spirit or if he was corporeal. Right, right. And uh, so I felt him pull it out of my hand so I know that it was a physical being that I was speaking with. And uh, I, I thought he was going to put it up to his mouth to play it, but he did something really strange that I didn't expect. He put it up to his nostrils and uh, he blew into it and he got a couple of notes out of it. And I wondered why, why would he put it to his nostrils? Yeah. And I got my answer uh, several years later when the Canadian UFO Research Network uh, continued researching my case. And uh, they showed me uh, 
an alien autopsy report that was uh, written up by Leonard Stringfield. And in that autopsy report, where they were autopsying a gray being, they said that the mouth, they didn't have a complete digestive system like we have. Right. They have, uh, the mouth is just basically a pocket and it stops at the throat. Oh. And they have one organ that does the job of the lungs, the uh, liver, and uh, the heart. And so they, they can only breathe through their nose. And that answered okay. my question. Why he had to use his nose to yeah. blow the flute. So anyway, uh, I took out one of the small recorders. I had like a, a little soprano that the, like the kids play in school. And uh, I offered it to him. I said, would you like this? Would you like to take it as a souvenir? And he said, what is a souvenir? <laughs> and uh, I said, it, it's... Uh, Whatever like, you kept from my body when you <laughs> did those experiments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and I said, well, it's uh, like a gift to remember me by. And he said, that would be fine. And so he took it and he... You just put it to his belt, and it stayed there. Oh, that's like cool. A, uh, like a magnetic. And uh, so uh, I was thinking to myself, uh, I'll have to replace that. I hope that store I got it from uh, has more of them like that, because <laughs> yeah. I like that one. And he immediately took it off his belt and said, oh. would you like it back? And oh. I said, no, no. You know, I kept forgetting that they, they can read your mind. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, no, you keep it. Uh, I want you to have it. And he said, okay. So he put it back on his belt. And it's probably out there somewhere in some alien museum. That's on, so cool, you know? right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he said, would you like me to walk you back to your vehicle? And I said, no, that's okay. I can go back. And I said, am I going to see you again? And he said, yes, you'll see us again. And so I turned around, I walked back to the vehicle, and I got in through the back doors, and uh, everybody was sort of, it looked like they were all in suspended animation. They were just completely still. And when I got in, they all came to life, and they were in the middle of a conversation. And the drummer looked at me, and he said, uh, he said, we've, agreed on something and we need you to agree to it and i said what and he said we have to agree that we are not going to talk about this and we are not going to tell anybody about this but they knew who they were talking to right like you already touched the side of the the craft you looked away when you were told not to so <laughs> well, it's funny that you they they brought you in on that like it's just yeah. funny because you were you well, were defiant all yeah. the way through, like in a, in a, not in a negative way, but you were defiant because you're so curious. Yeah. So that's interesting. So what did you agree to? Well, uh, uh, it was the drummer that said this. He said, we have to agree that we're not going to talk about this or tell it to anybody. And I said, no, I said, I'm not going to agree to that. And he said, well, listen, he said, if you tell anybody about this, we're just going to deny it and you'll look like an idiot. Oh, geez. And I was really upset because uh, I, I thought, no, people should know about this. And I also noticed something strange is that the hitchhiker wasn't with us anymore. Oh. And I wondered, why wasn't he with us? And I thought maybe he might have been a, planted with us purposely for the purpose of opening that door. You know? Right, right. And I well, kind of suspected. Well, took off running, maybe, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, you discussed that really quickly because we got to wrap this up, but I wanted okay. to briefly touch on a couple of things. You mentioned that um, your one friend had asked, do you have any bases? And they mentioned Lake Ontario. Yeah. And I literally just watched a program about Shag Harbor in Nova Scotia where they experienced a uh, UFO crashing right. into, the, into the ocean there. And mm -hmm. they went out to find the debris from the crash site um, because a lot of people had witnessed this. It wasn't just one person that was coming from it. It was a lot of people had witnessed this. And they only found this orange-yellow foam 
on the surface where they where they had thought it had gone in. Right. Now, I have been on Lake Ontario uh, mm-hmm. a lot. I grew up around in this area and fishing, swimming, boating, that kind of fun stuff. And I have often seen orangey yellow foam on the lake. So that's interesting. I thought that yep. it, when you mentioned that, I was like, that's an, an interesting thing. Um, the other thing that uh, strikes me as interesting was your question. Mm-hmm. What's the true religion? Yeah. And they said there is no true religion. How has that changed your life? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting because uh, I was raised in religion most of my life. And um, then I sort of fell away from it in my teenage years uh, around that time. And uh, later, I, uh, I became a born-again Christian for a number of years. And I kind of put the UFO memories on the shelf right. at that point. And I found that I couldn't seem to fit with the, uh, with the Christian theology. Uh, I had too many questions that they couldn't answer. And it, it just didn't resonate with me. And right. even though I tried to fit it, I tried everything I could to blend in, but I just never felt that it, uh, it fit me. So do you believe in God? Definitely. Okay. So it's not that you have a disconnect from God. It's the, the, um, the, the, the religion and, the, and their belief systems and all that you can't resonate Exactly. comfortably with and i yeah. appreciate that because i'm the same as you um the other like really important question i want to ask and i'm sure a lot of people have been asking or thinking this mm-hmm. that evening you were performing music and um you were with your band mm-hmm. did anybody take any hallucinogenic drugs that night no and i mean that no. with all sincerity mm-hmm. but there was no drugs or alcohol abuse that night so this isn't something that could have been you know imagined this literally happened yes and that uh, you know i already asked you that question but i wanted to make Mm -hmm. sure that we we had it for the viewers because there will be people thinking and asking that question right right um well it might be difficult for them to figure out what i must have been stoned on when i was four years old well exactly (laughs) good point good point so now the last question the people that you were with um because you had all agreed to not make this public you've obviously come forward yes have you spoken to any of them since then and what's their thoughts on you coming forward with this well i have spoken to uh, some of them the drummer's girlfriend remembered part of it uh incidentally she ended up marrying the guitarist by the way <laughs> but, uh, well, that's good that's cute and uh, uh the uh, the marriage didn't last uh, and she remarried somebody else and she's moved away but she did remember uh the part of it where the uh, alien head went by the window right because she was still in the van when everything went down yeah right okay yeah and um uh, the bass player, I believe he died. Um, and the guitarist, uh, he went under hypnosis um, on the prompting of uh, the guys from the Canadian UFO Research Network that were working on my case. Right. They spoke to him, and uh, he went under hypnosis, but nothing came out. And uh, the hypnotist told the researchers that she felt that he was resisting, that he didn't want to remember. The fact that he even went and did that is a testament to, you know, he must have felt something to to put himself in that position. So that's interesting. Very interesting. The drummer, uh, he doesn't remember anything consciously. And I've tried to get him to sit down with me so I can tell him the story and see if it triggers any memories in him, but he won't even do that. Right. You know. Probably petrified. He was you know. very Well, like, let's face it, you're, you're talking about being abducted by aliens. This is mm-hmm. something that, 
you know, it's not mainstream and you'll be labeled a weirdo or, you know, mm-hmm. you're a liar or what have you. So it's yeah. very brave of you to come forward, I have to say. Extremely brave of you to come forward with this story. Well, there's, well, there's just one one more thing I'd like to mention. Yeah. is uh, uh, Just recently, I got a major breakthrough in that case because the hitchhiker that we picked up that night uh, which is about 45 years ago or yeah. so now, saw my video on YouTube. No way. And came forward, and he contacted me. And uh, he said, I believe I was the hitchhiker that you guys picked up. Wow. And he said, uh, when you mentioned the part about the being tripping on the uh, snare drum stand and the drum falling out, he said, that's when I stood up in my chair. He said, I, I was shocked because I remember that. Wow. And he told me that he had actually positioned it that way so that the alien would trip over it. He wanted to uh. see if, if he would trip over it. And he mentioned parts of the conversation that we had in the van that I had never mentioned in any of my videos. Okay. And as he was telling me these parts of the conversation, I was remembering them myself. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. So I know it was him. Wow. You know? well, would he come forward, do you think, and speak publicly about it? Well, I've asked him about it, and he doesn't want to do that at this point. He said, uh, you know, you can use some of the um, information from our conversation right. in your book, but he said, I... I not prepared to come forward with well, it. Well, let's put, let's put this out there. If he decides that that changes, have him get in touch with me. I would love to follow up with his sure. recollection of the story. Well, yeah. it has been an absolute pleasure um, chatting with you, Steve, about this mm. situation. And thank you so much for sharing such an epic story with us. Um, yeah. We cannot thank you enough. And if anybody wants to connect with you, they can find you through um, just ba- basically Googling your cert, your, your name through yep. search, and we're going to put your information in the uh, credits. So okay. thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Have yeah. a great night.